Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks a lot for coming uh, on time after the lunch break. Welcome to the main session, uh, second main session of today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the, the morning one, uh, which uh, I think inspired all of us also for the breakup session that followed. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Kazimierz Jazdowski. I am the member of uh, Cabinet of the European Data Protection Supervisor. And I'll have an honor to moderate this next session in a second. In the morning, we had a pleasure to follow a debate on the objectives behind enforcement, on what constitutes effective enforcement, and why do we need a culture of compliance. Our speakers engaged in a lively conversation on the achievements in the field so far, on what needs to be improved, and what potential obstacles are being faced in practice. And now we would like to build on this conversation and continue by zooming in on these obstacles, trying to reflect on their nature and on the means to overcome them. I'll be joined in a second by amazing speakers who, coming from different perspectives and backgrounds, all share a genuine interest in and commitment to the effective functioning of the GDPR. We'll have four speakers joining me, although the fourth one is slightly late, I believe. But let me invite on stage at the moment uh, Fanny Hidvegi, Orla Linsky, Toby Junin, and in a second, Juan Fernando Lopez Aguilar. Please welcome them with a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me start by a few words of introduction, and I will join our speakers uh, on stage. I think it's fair to say, and uh, the conversation we had today confirmed it in a way, that in a public perception, there's not enough has been done in respect of addressing certain practices, uh, in particular when it comes to, to big actors, big players. And especially if we think of, of the expectations around the powers of the data protection authorities when the GDPR was adopted. We heard earlier today why there is a need to step up enforcement efforts. We also heard some views that certain structural circumstances make it difficult for data protection authorities to deliver fully the promise of the GDPR. Among them, I allowed, my, I allowed myself to distinguish three. One, a question of fair sharing of burden and resources. Two, the differences between procedural rules of member states that often make the cooperation between data protection authorities lengthy or sometimes very difficult in practice. And three, the role of the EDPB, especially in the consistency mechanism procedures, which some might call as coming a little bit too late in the process. As the panel description says, while the problems are legal, their consequences are political. Organization of the governance model, enforcement model, is therefore not only a technical choice, but a political one, in a way, in an Aristotelian sense of this word. I would therefore like to start our discussion today by looking at these issues through the perspective of basic principles of EU law. Is the one-stop shop model fair? Is it meeting the principle of effectiveness of EU law? And here I would like to first turn to Professor Orlalinski. Orla is an associate professor at LSE Law School and a visiting professor at the College of Europe, Bruges. But Recently, you were, you, were, you were working on the constitutional aspects of one-stop shop mechanism. So I'd like to start our discussion by asking you, um, how do you see these structural issues? Do you uh, agree with my uh, list of three issues? Do you have your own list that you've been working on recently? How would you place these issues in the broader context of fairness and effectiveness of EU law? Orla, over to you. Uh, thanks, Kajik. So, um as you've heard, I've been thinking about the ways in which, with a colleague of mine, Julia Gentile, um, the one-stop shop uh, sits within the general EU enforcement framework. And we were trying to map potential issues with the one-stop shop in a, in, a, in a more systematic way, querying really whether um, this is a question of a system that is deficient by design, or whether or not it can be remedied from within by simply kicking the tires a little bit to, um, to get things going. And really, we identified four key issues, some of which I think have already been mentioned this morning. So 
we heard about procedural ambiguities and divergences, and here we have these at EU level um, in the systems uh, put in place by for cooperation and consistency, so a lack of clarity perhaps about terms like undue delay, draft decision, but of course the EDPB has now provided guidelines on how those terms should be interpreted. We also have the issues that I think Max Schrems um, and uh, Bayuk have very nicely outlined in their work around national procedures, so divergences in things like standing, complaint handling, like the Access Now report um, recently published demonstrates, but also things about the right to be heard, access to file, etc. So I think these are pretty well-versed issues. In addition to these issues, we identified three further ones. So the first is what we call a lack of equality between the national supervisory agencies. So we know from the case law of the court that the LSA, the lead supervisory authority, is meant to act as a first amongst equals. However, um, in the procedure itself um, for, for cooperation, this isn't the way in which things are working out in practice because the role of supervisory authorities concerned is being minimized in this process. And I think you see this in, in, in two particular ways. If we think of an investigation which, first of all, involves the scoping of the infringement, then fact-finding, then a finding of infringement, and then enforcement, the lead supervisory authority really plays an outsized role at the moment uh, in terms of scoping and in terms of final enforcement. And that minimizes the role of the representatives of data subjects in other states. Equally, where other supervisory authorities concerned want to intervene, the threshold to do so is actually really significant, that threshold of relevant and reasoned objection. So on the whole, what you see is, is a picture of inequality between the NSAs. You might say, well, why is this important? Uh, as long as we, we kind of get things done, why is this important? Well, I think there are two issues. One is a legitimacy issue. Um, the system of enforcement that we got through the GDPR was uh, on the basis of a, a compromise between states, where effectively the power of very active DPAs was neutered in favor of, or it, to, to the sacrifice, to the greater good of effective transnational enforcement. But that bargain hasn't necessarily materialized. So we have, I think, a legitimacy issue there. But more importantly, by removing the, the supervisory authorities concerned from the process of cooperation in a, in a kind of a, a continuous way, you are, as I said, removing the representatives of data subjects across those member states from, from the picture. And therefore, you're hindering the right to an effective remedy of data subjects in other EU member states. We also have issues of procedural fairness. So um, the exclusion of complainants from the processes of lead supervisory authorities in some circumstances. And I think uh, some issues around um, the right of complainants to challenge the, the actions of a lead supervisory authority because that has to happen before the court uh, in the, the, the state of the lead supervisory authority. So Advocate General Bobek in, in, in the Facebook Belgium case said, this system was designed to prevent data subjects from touring the courtrooms of Europe. But in fact, as we heard um, from Max Schrems and uh, Ursula Packel this morning, um, what, what you see is for an organization like Bayuk to challenge a decision, they need to go to the, to the court of the lead supervisory authority where they often incur huge costs. And then finally, and I think um, Paul Niemitz raised this, I think the unequal application of the law is in itself a rule of law issue. And um, several people have written in the past about how the one-stop shop system seeks to harmonize the application of the law, but as Hilke Hymans has pointed out, it doesn't harmonize the strategies used by DPAs in pursuit of their application of the law. And so where a DPA, for instance, uses an own volition inquiry or an amicable settlement to short circuit um, the OSS and to avoid its application, we end up in situations where we have an unequal application of the law and this in turn will lead to forum shopping. Um, so patchy protection for individuals and regulatory advantages for data controllers that establish themselves in those states where there is this patchy protection. So that's kind of how we saw the lay of the land when we, when we looked at the, 
the materials that were available on the one-stop shop. Thank you, Orla. That's, uh, that's a lot of food for thought for for next uh, series of questions. Um, I wanted to pass the floor immediately to to, to Toby uh, because you've been. Maybe I should also introduce you. Huh? Uh, Toby is uh, head of international affairs in the Norwegian Data Protection Authority, and. And the reason we have Toby here with us, who kindly um, accepted our invitation, is because you've been quite open in past months, in particular, about how uh, you and your authority sees um, the issues, and you are trying to present them in a in a more institutional or, or uh, structural way. Mm. How, how do you see uh, that in the context of what Orla has just said um, and what I just said at the beginning? Sure, thank you. And thank you for the invitation as well. I think that all this intervention was, was really good and the, uh, the issues that you flagged, I very much recognize. I think we can all recognize them. Um, and I think also your summary was, was quite good. And so I thought I'd speak a bit to, to how, it, how it actually is to cooperate um, between DPAs. And I must say that for the most part, it is a great experience. Um, I can assure you that DPAs are working very hard, sometimes around the clock. Uh, at the same time, we're four years in to the GDPR. I remember working at the Norwegian DPA when we first got the GDPR and thinking, oh, finally, now we're going to solve all of these really big issues. I don't think we have solved all of those issues yet. I don't think we will be solving them within the next two or three years either. So when you have DPAs who are really working very hard and trying to find innovative ways to do enforcement, but we're not changing how the internet looks, that does suggest to me that there are structural systemic issues. Um, and some of them are already outlined, uh, but for example, um, sometimes a DPA may feel a bit impatient about um, an issue that has occurred with a controller which is situated in a different EU EEA member state. However, that DPA cannot simply reach out to the lead supervisory authority and say, hey, can you please enforce this or investigate this? Because at the end of the day, we're all independent DPAs and that's of course very important and very good but they may see different issues. They may identify different issues in their strategic work plans. And so an issue which is EU-wide and is perhaps a priority for my authority is not necessarily the same for the lead supervisory authority. So we do not um, override each, other, uh, uh, each other's prioritizations, which is very logical. I, I wouldn't want that to happen anyway. Uh, but then the, when you do see an investigation come, come through, um, there's sometimes disagreement as to how it is scoped. And this is, you know, it, it's obviously very important to deal with all the complaints, with all due diligence, but sometimes you need own volition, ex officio action as well. And that is within the discretion of the lead supervisory authority, how to scope it, whether it should happen, which issues it should uh, look into. Um, and I think that's a bit of an unfortunate situation. We're also seeing that sometimes the lead supervisory authority is being accused of not following EDPB guidance or even producing draft decisions, which it already knows that the majority of the EDPB will most likely disagree with, but they still do it. And so what happens is the procedure will then take even longer and there's a lot of disagreement uh, about not only the scope, but also the end result. Obviously, we have a mechanism for that. But also, also speaking to what Ola mentioned about the concerned supervisory authorities being involved at a very late stage, at that stage, it is often too late to, to change any of this. But actually, it would all, always be impossible to do so unless the lead supervisory authority is, willing to, is unwilling to listen to the majority or is willing to... Uh, to do the necessary. Um, and these issues are quite difficult to deal with. Um, and again, I'm not saying that any of the DPAs are necessarily in the wrong for having their own opinions, but oftentimes we're talking about EU-wide, EEA-wide issues. 
So why should they, these issues, why should they be dealt with with a national authority in a small country or a medium country when it's an issue for all of Europe? To me, that's a bit strange. And again, it doesn't really ensure proximity to the data subjects either. And of course, sometimes you have the situations that uh, national parliaments or treasuries become kind of gatekeepers to the right to data protection, because they decide how much money the DPA will get, how much resources will they get, how many people will they have to deal with the complaints and launch investigations. And again, these are e EEA-wide issues. So they should really be tackled, I think, on an EU level in order to ensure that the fundamental rights are fully respected uh, in, in the EU. And I think I'll end my intervention there. Thank you, Toby. Thank you very much. Um, you actually answered the, the next three questions that we prepared for today. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we, we, we cannot conclude the panel now yet. Uh, first of all, before we do that, uh, I would like to pass the floor to Fanny, who um, has been recently recognized by Politico mm. personally, but also as uh, head of uh, Access Now in Europe for the tremendous work in protecting digital rights. And I use the word digital rights on purpose because it's broader than, than the data protection context. Um, and this is also why we thought Fanny would be a great addition to this panel because maybe having listening to this conversation so far, maybe without producing what, what we're going to say, but maybe you find this too legalistic or too technical. Maybe we're missing the point. Maybe there are just excuses um, why things are not working perfectly, whereas they should be working, or maybe not. So I would like to hear from you what you think on that. Thank you, and thank you for bringing that up. It's, it's a recognition for the entire team, and particularly to Estelle Massé, who is in this room and who will speak uh, on another panel on this subject. But I will start with uh, some political um, political considerations and then uh, get to the more legalistic ones. And for now, I'll, I'll stick to the problem statement challenges and in, I suspect we'll discuss solutions a bit <laughs> later. So um, um, in, my, in my view, obviously, we talk about sharing the burden of enforcement and I understand that framing for this particular room. But if you just take a step back, my initial um, reaction to it was why, why the burden is about enforcement and why not, it, it, the burden should not be either on individuals or the regulators. In an ideal world, what we would have is a better functioning market with higher level of data protection, but also human rights respecting public sector and governments. And obviously with the Pegasus case and many more, that's not the trend we are seeing now, but that's a side, a side note, of course. The, as, as we talked about this all morning, the GDPR is very young. Uh, at the same time, the deficiencies are very real. I agree that we need the improvement, but I think we really strongly have to push back against the narrative that this is a complete failure. I, I think it's quite funny how in the freedom, security and justice area, I don't see the European Commission that adamantly talking about deficiencies and failures. For instance, uh, the European investigation order is one of my personal favorite that could be improved. Um, so you asked about legal excuses, right? Um, I don't think it's a legal excuse, but there's definitely a conflict of laws between uh, national procedures and practices, and those do impede on people's access uh, to remedy and the enforcement of the GDPR. To better share the burden, uh, I think as as we are doing it all day, we are looking at the problems, why they are not being enforced. We talked about the resources, the backlog, the problems with cooperation, the no answers to complaints, and Orla's very um, um, comprehensive list. And a new study about once you have the right to lodge a complaint, then what happens? Who's Whose fault is this? This is what we are asking from each other, who is not doing their job. and. Uh, of course, we all recognize the responsibility of data protection authorities 
and we welcome the progress and the willingness for cooperation and the Vienna Statement and the pool of experts in particular. But I'd like to highlight the role of the Commission a bit, because that we didn't discuss that much and there was a bit of pushback from, from uh, uh, Mr. Nemitz, if I heard him correctly. But I do think that the Commission needs to step up and it's been enough of monitoring uh, in the past four years. They can start infringement procedures against member states and, and other countries that, as to be described, are an obstacle in putting um, the necessary resources. And a simple way of looking at a budget increase is not going to be enough. We need to check the proportions, not to mention the AI Act is coming and how much more even DPAs and others will have to take on. And final thought, to add something new, I think I haven't heard this in, in the conversations today, about independence, but not from the usual independence angle. I'm from Hungary, so I know very well the drill of the lack of constitutional independence of the Hungarian Data Protection Authority, but this is not what I want to talk about. What I would like to see is a Europe-wide study that shows data protection authorities' lenience and, and decisions when, when there's a case in the public sector and in the private sector, and within the public sector, if there's a difference between, let's say, local government issues and central governments. I know for a fact that there are studies in Hungary that points a very clear data that there is a problem of independence beyond that political constitutional level. And I would be very curious to see the practices of data protection authorities on that front all around Europe. Thank you, Fanny, and thank you for uh, bringing the topic of, of, of supervising also the public sector. And this is something that uh, the, there is also part of the conference program dedicated to that because I think there is an increasing recognition that indeed this uh, requires at least the same amount of attention as, as the supervision of, of, of private companies. And also your points on independence and rule of law uh, resonate also personally with me given my country of origin. I think before we talk uh, solutions, because we have a lot of um, definitions of the problems of different nature, uh, I believe I'm, I will be able to sum them up in a way that allows us to, to progress the conversation. But since you are calling on the Commission to act, we have a representative of another institution with us joining online, I believe, uh, as I can see here as well. And we would like to uh, hear from Mr. Aguilar, Aguilar, who is a chair of the LIBE committee, who has been crucial for years in creating the GDPR and then monitoring the GDPR. What are your views, Mr. Aguilar, on where we are now? Um, how do you approach this monitoring process from the perspective of, from the institutional perspective? How do you see the, the progress so far and where would you like to go in the next couple of years? So over to you. Thank you so much, you so first much. of all. Thank you for inviting me. Me on board, my honor and pleasure. Second, I'm sorry that I couldn't make it present. I couldn't be physically there because I had an absolutely indispensable commitment that I should attend out of breath. But having this question in mind as to the European Parliament perspective, as to the developments that have followed after the legislation we put in place the GDPR, the data protection package, consisting of the regulation and the law enforcement directive. Again, I'm highlighting, I'm underlining that the overall assessment is a success. That it has been a, not only a success responding to the challenge that we were supposed to face, but also <clears throat> a success compared to all the negative prognosis that we also had to face because there were warnings about the difficulties, about the challenges, about the shortcomings. But overall, not only we have assessed positively the implementation and the delivery of the package so far, but we have set a standard which happens to be, let's highlight it once again, the highest in the world. It's the highest standard in the world. 
Well, one thing, it has increased awareness of the rights of the European citizens. And we're talking about rights, fundamental rights, which are enshrined in the Charter of Fundamental Rights, Article 8 of the Charter. Second, we have strengthened cooperation between national data protection authorities. And of course, under the overview of the European Data Protection Supervisor and the board. And we have unified data protection rules for businesses, big companies, medium companies, small companies, small businesses operating all across the European Union. But as regards its enforcement, of course, we have seen issues. We have seen also problems regarding particularly the differences, the variations between national administrative procedures, which have posed a significant problem, practical problem for GDPR cross-border cases, differences between national administrative procedures and the fact that in some member states, no deadlines are foreseen for handling cases created an obstacle to the better functioning, for the most effective functioning of the so-called one-stop shop. A few data protection authorities are responsible for handling large numbers of cases, since many tech companies, of course, have opted to register their headquarters in a selected range of member states. We also take note of a high number of administrative fines imposed for different infringements and progress data protection authorities constantly making this point but it's also important to point out that still only a small share of complaints submitted with the data protection authorities have been followed up. So the Libre Committee, the Parliament, is concerned about the length of case investigations by some data protection authorities, including within the one-stop shop mechanism. Adverse effect on effective enforcement on citizens' trust. That is an area where, beyond any doubt, Improvement is essential. Improvement is necessary. And a final point I would make is that Libre Committee shows concern on a significant number of data protection authorities having explicitly stated that they do not have sufficient human, technical, and financial resources, premises, infrastructures to effectively perform their tasks and exercise their powers to their, to their very best. So in this context, we underline the importance of expertise, high-tech intelligence, expertise in the field of data protection, digital services, becoming increasingly complex due to increased innovations like artificial intelligence, which is an unfolding development before our very eyes and technical knowledge is also necessary to assess and protect our citizens' rights with proper funding, with proper technical means and financial resources for data protection authorities. Those are, I guess, the main points of concerns that recurrently have been expressed throughout the resolution and implementation reports that we have adopted so far, the years in which the data protection package has been enforced, but I insist, overall, it's been a success and a landmark throughout the world. Thank you, Mr. Aguilar. I don't know if you if can, yes, you can hear me now. Thank you, Mr. Aguilar, for, for a comprehensive intervention in a sense of uh, reminding us what, like, how great uh, as an achievement of the European Union GDPR is, and I think the reason why we are here is exactly because we want this to continue to be the, uh, the standard that, uh, that we are so proud of. And also the conference program includes many discussions and panels about the importance of enforcement in order to maintain the, um, kind of the export nature of the GDPR uh, globally. But also thanks, you, thanks for your points on, uh, on the concerns of Libe and uh, the areas within which uh, you would like to, to focus in the next months and in years, namely the length of investigations, uh, adverse effectiveness on the, on the data subjects, but also the issue, the issue of resources, which actually also um, applies in a way to, to the resources of the, of the ADPB. Uh, we have 
been talking for half an hour now, uh, even a bit more, so I think it's time to talk uh, solutions. Um, Orla, you mentioned a uh, few aspects that are making the cooperation difficult. You also pointed at um, some problems of, let's say, more uh, political nature, whether there is a legitimacy, whether there is equality. Yeah? So I think we cannot, uh, we cannot discuss all of them in details now, but I think the whole two days program of the conference will try to address them. But I would like to focus on a few, huh? if I may. Mm, something that we've been hearing recently a lot, and this is also something that you mentioned, is the uh, potential harmonization of certain procedural rules. To what extent do you think such an initiative would address at least certain issues that you have identified in the current model? Thanks. So, so maybe just to, to begin by saying that um, I don't think anybody's having a, necessarily having a conversation about the GDPR being uh, a failure. <laughs> I think most people in the room, uh, as we heard earlier, are very proud of the GDPR. It's about rights needing remedies and about rendering a law that is on the books more, more effective in practice. And I, I think thinking about how you could do that, so something if we took that example of the lack of equality between the national supervisory authorities, well, I said that you have the, this kind of outsized or disproportionate role of the lead supervisory authority uh, when it comes to scoping of the investigation and then when it comes to the, the ultimate enforcement. And actually, I think if you look at a decision um, of the EDPB in something like the Twitter case, you see that quite nicely. Um, the, the infringement was scoped very narrowly by the, by the Irish DPC in that instance, um, to the exclusion of a lot of legitimate concerns by other uh, supervisory authorities concerned. And when it came to the ultimate enforcement of that decision, um, although other authorities like the German authorities had proposed a fine somewhere in the range of 7 to 22 million euro, what we had was a fine of 450,000 euro. So you can see there that even though we're supposed to have equality between authorities, what we're getting is this disproportionate impact of some authorities. I think that is a legal issue, though. <laughs> um, and, and I think the first port of call before procedural harmonization has to be to look at the existing rules we have in the GDPR to see whether or not they provide any solutions um, to, that, to that type of scenario. And so we can see that the um, EDPB has introduced these guidelines. We can see, I guess, um, whether the Article 60 guidelines will actually bed down to lead to any more effective cooperation between national authorities. If they don't, what are the options? Well, um, we've already heard from Fanny and others about, about infringement proceedings on the part of the Commission. And here, um, I had noted that I think if you look at recital 135 of the GDPR, it doesn't, I'm sorry to be a complete lawyer on this, <laughs> but it doesn't seem to kind of totally preclude the role of the Commission uh, in uh, enforcing the GDPR. Instead, what it says is that the consistency mechanism should be without prejudice to measures that the Commission may take, basically in the exercise of its treaty powers, i.e. <laughs> um, the, the guardian of the treaties. So even initiating infringement proceedings, which as we know involves a dialogue with member states, might be enough to kind of um, encourage more effective cooperation. If that's not the case, I think we'll also find some help from, uh, you know, in the case law of the Court of Justice. When you look at the Facebook Belgium case, it really emphasizes that despite the kind of wording of Article 60, that the entire cooperation procedure is underpinned by a process of sincere cooperation. Any failure to involve other NSAs until the point where you have a draft decision is a failure of that sincere cooperation. And that is not a political principle, that is a legally binding principle, which when you couple it with Article 19 of the treaties gives rise to this, this issue of effectiveness. So for me, I think, and in, in terms of the paper with Julia, um, we've kind of argued that the first port of call would be to, to test a little bit further, understanding that there's frustration about slow enforcement, um, these mechanisms. <laughs> Thank you, Orla. And I think you just, it just made me think that it's kind of symmetrical to the discussion we had in the morning on the need to have multiple paths, huh? that we cannot just say, Okay, then let's wait for the infringement and uh, enjoy the time, you know, f for now. Uh, do you think, Toby, that this is, uh, this is enough or is it 
Um, it's more of a question of timeline that, of course, we should start somewhere and then and maybe in the longer term, other paths should be explored. Um, how would you react to, to what Ola said? Yeah, so first of all, I would like to echo what Ola said, is that the GDPR is very successful in very many aspects. And actually, I would say that the one-stop shop mechanism is also extremely successful to the point where we're seeing, you know, new draft decisions, new final decisions coming out every single week, uh, but often in smaller cases where not so many supervisory authorities are involved. So certainly there's a lot of good there. Um, but I would also like to flag that actually the EDPB has, you know, really been stepping it, it up and really being innovative in terms of how we cooperate and how we kind of use that scope of cooperation, trying to look at what does sincere cooperation actually mean, uh, including recommendations to, for example, share information at a very early stage, uh, which is a very concrete measure. Uh, but still, we're in, we're, we're in this position nonetheless. Um, so, no, I do not think that it is enough, and I think we need to do more. And I think there is a certain sense of urgency, because if we find out at some point that we actually need legislative changes, we all know that legislation takes a long time, right? And of course, we have the GDPR as it is now in, in, in the meanwhile, which is good, so I don't think that data should be, such subjects should be worried. Um, but it means that at this point in time, we need to identify all of the issues and we need to find a solution that is tailored to those solutions specifically. And for example, talking about procedural harmonization, I see that you know, affecting positively a lot of the issues that are already flagged, but I don't think it will actually solve all of them. Um, and again... Would you like to say why? So for example, um, there is disagreement um, among stakeholders as to what cooperation entails and who has the final say about things. Um, and I'm not sure if new legislation will actually uh, change that. Um, and I also think, you know, it's not always clear what we are talking about when we say procedural harmonization. It seems like it's just a magic silver bullet and everyone agrees on what it will be. Actually, that will not be the case, I think. Um, picking up on what, what was being said about legal standing, I know that some stakeholders are flagging that, you know, perhaps NGOs standing should be limited or it should be permissible to set conditions for their participation as a party uh, to the case, um, which I'm personally very worried about. Our position is the exact opposite. They should have full party rights, period. Um, and, you know, there are also other measures that could be conceived in a procedural harmonization. And, you know, I, I often uh, refer to, to Austrian colleagues because in Austria they have this duty to deal with cases within six months. And the Austrian SA, Data Protection Authority, they actually do it as well. And I think it's absolutely brilliant. But we should be very careful to think that, okay, that is a solution that will fit everywhere. If you try to push that solution on someone who simply do not have the resources or the capabilities to deal with a case within six months, what's going to start happening? Well, they're going to start making shortcuts because they know we have to deal with it. It's, it's measurable, so we just need to deal with the case. But actually, I think the GDPR also says that as data protection authorities, we need to deal with cases with due diligence. We need to ensure that rights are effectively vindicated. Um, and so, when you have uh, a legal supervisory authority uh, who does not agree as to what you should be looking into, does not agree with the guidance from the EDPB, or is not agreeing as to what cooperation actually entails, just trying to make more details around it, I would call it scaffolding, or trying to introduce new, new data protection rules here and there, we run the risk of creating more administration, more of an administrative burden, whereas I think we need a tailored solution and we need to figure out what that solution is now so that we can start working on it. I don't think we could do it progressively and start with one thing, one, one form of procedural harmonization, and then that's going to take a few years, and then we'll, we'll give it four more years to see if that works, and oh, no, it didn't work, and then we need to figure out something else. That's, you know, what, 12, 13 years down the line? We don't have that much time. Um, and so on, on our end, we would say that for the, the biggest cases, where, you know, almost all of Europe, or all of Europe is involved somehow, 
then it would also make sense to deal with the case at a European level. And I don't think that necessarily needs to be a big change because you already have the EDPB. And in these cases often end up going to the EDPB nonetheless. And the EDPB actually, they, they pool the resources and they are able to deal with the case within certain deadlines. So there you have something which could actually be feasible feasible without creating something new, without creating additional burden, which is why we think that is an avenue that could be explored. And we see that actually dealing with a lot of these issues. And of course, procedural harmonization could also be brought into that in terms of what procedures should the EPB follow, should they be given a more prominent role. Thank you, Toby. It's very easy to moderate the panel by asking people to review and assess what the person before said. But I will change this narrative a little bit and I'll maybe give all an opportunity maybe to react in 30 seconds to what Toby said. Would you like to comment? Uh, yes. So I, I, I guess with, with regard to the, the idea that the EDPB would directly enforce, so kind of moving to that kind of direct enforcement model at, at EU level, I can see the attraction of that uh, in many ways. I don't think we should underestimate the extent to which that would make it an anomaly <laughs> in EU law terms. Already, um, you know, the EDPB is a body, not an agency. Um, the EDPB is kind of one of very few independent authorities. I would put in there maybe the um, Security and Markets Authority that has this power to issue binding decisions in some instances. But really, in EU law, enforcement at a, at a central level is, is the exception rather than the rule, because you still have an issue of enforcement um, kind of on the ground. And that has typically been... Um, the burden or the responsibility of member states. So I think you would at least face quite a significant political challenge there and probably a subsidiarity challenge without having tried alternative mechanisms. And, you know, again, if I go back to that, uh, the Facebook Belgium case, you could see even there the Advocate General kind of hinting that concerns about the, the one-stop shop were at this stage premature. However, if it transpired, <laughs> and, and that was obviously a few years ago, but if it transpired that the one-stop shop wasn't functioning effectively, um, he hinted that the court could resort to in, uh, consistent interpretation in order to interpret Article 60 in a way that forced cooperation, effective cooperation, or a question of invalidity, <laughs> you know, where you simply strike out those provisions of the GDPR because in practice they are proving to be incompatible with the Charter. So I, I see it as a bit of a jump to go from where we are now to direct enforcement. I can see the procedural harmonization kind of provides uh, a bit of a bridge. Um, you know, of, of course, you would need a, a new legislative instrument. And as I'm sure everybody in the room knows, that, that brings risks <laughs> as well as opportunities, like the bottoming out of things like standing. Um, but I do think everyone needs to think now about what would be included in that kind of procedural instrument. And keeping in mind that we're talking about the procedural harmonization of a regulatory administrative agency rather than necessarily judicial, uh, the harmonization of judicial proceedings, which might make it slightly less politically contentious. Thank you very much, Orla. Fanny, what's, what would be your uh, magic solution, your scenario, your complex uh, set of uh, actions to be taken between now and ever, you know, in the future. Uh, <laughs> sure. Um, my list of uh, solutions is also like in a tiered approach. I will just explicitly say that for access now, reopening the GDPR itself for now is a hard no. Um, we didn't even discuss it, but just, just to put it out there. Um, and the second layer, I, uh, I will start with saying that uh, data protection in the human rights system is an individual right. And we're not even discussing in this room the additional conversations we have to have about addressing the collective impact of these, of these violations. Um, and what I find interesting is that most of the big cases that are mentioned have nothing unique to the data subject or the complainant who brought them in a legal sense. Uh, it could be anybody, and I apologize for putting Max Schrems on the spot, but the uniqueness of, of Max, Max is not the legal question pertinent to him because he's questioning uh, systematic legal issues. And so 
what I'm at, qu questioning is why is the main expectation on individuals and then on the regulators to deal with these, uh, with these things? We are adding the pressure on the wrong side of the equation, in my view. And so some of the solutions that don't require a new law, not even a procedural harmonization at the moment, where I would start, is much more um, ex officio or own investigations for these systematic cases, instead of uh, waiting on individual complaints, with the caveat, of course, that it cannot be a form of abuse of not responding and following up on individuals' uh, rights. Uh, but it works in the competition sector extremely well. And um, the second one, and it's one um, a finding of, of the study, actually, is uh, much more visibility to NGOs, under, even under just the current framing. We don't see data protection authorities promoting this pro bono, free, legal aid, information, and even re legal representation for civil society, sorry, for, for individuals by, by civil society. And if we go to a potential new procedural law, then uh, in it we'll have to have more space for collective redress, obviously in alignment with what's, what's coming. Uh, is it the end of the year? Um, and uh, other items in that could be to clarify, of course, the enforcement system and how EU law should be applicable above national procedure in the context of a sole EU competence such as data protection. Um, the, uh, we agree with the extension of, uh, extension of power of the European Data Protection Board as well, but that was discussed uh, in detail. So this would be our starting point for the solutions. Thank you very much, Fanny. I think that concludes the, the long list of to do. And I think it's a moment to turn to the audience and uh, hear your views, your comments, and your questions to our speakers. Uh, I guess our colleagues have microphones ready. So please raise your hand if you have a question. There is someone literally in the middle up there. So if I can ask Niksha, maybe, or Chikesi to thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Oh. Uh, my name is Ralf Bendrad. I was involved in the GDPR <laughs> negotiations back then. Some of you might know that. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm now working at uh, the European Parliament for the Greens as advisor also on, on this matter. Um, Mr. Lopez Aguilar, um, you, I don't know, maybe forgot to, to point out an important element of the resolution we adopted last year um, following the Schrems 2 case. <laughs> which is the European Parliament calls on the Commission to open infringement procedures against Ireland. And I was a bit surprised that the whole hour we've been listening to you now, um, Hungary was mentioned and then there was some careful dancing around naming Ireland and also maybe Luxembourg, where the big techs are uh, established in Europe. But the Parliament has clearly out, uh, called out Ireland. And we can, I think, discuss at length improving uh, better cooperation and procedural issues and resources and so on. But as long as we have one central data protection authority where most of the tech companies are established, which is unwilling to do anything, then we still have a problem. And by the way, uh, our position is also to not reopen the GDPR. Not again, <laughs> please. <laughs> if I may. If I may add a comment, after having heard that question that had been fairly raised, I do completely agree. For the sake of time saving, I went to the point. Overall, positive assessment and issues, problems and challenges still unfolding, still at sight, and then ground to cover. But yes, we have adopted a number of resolutions that is part of the record of works of the Libre Committee after we put in place this relevant legislation, which is European legislation. I always insist that the European Parliament has become lawmaker more than ever before, ever since the Lisbon Treaty entered into force, along with the Charter of Fundamental Rights, with the same validity as the treaties, with the same value as the treaties. Article 6 
of the Treaty of the European Union. And that means that the European Parliament is a lawmaker on fundamental rights. And that is the competence of the Libre Committee, among other things, among migration and asylum, criminal law, procedural guarantees, security matters. There is legislation on protecting rights, fundamental rights. And that means data, confidentiality of data and confidentiality of personal communications. And that has meant a lot of works which are complementary to the legislation we adopted, including resolutions in which we have shed light on the need of action and a course of action to be uh, taken, to be endorsed by, by the Commission when needed, fulfilling its role as guardian of the treaties. That's what we did when we noticed that there were data protection authorities failing to comply with their tasks, failing to do their duty. And we named, yes, we named Ireland. More than that, I'm sure you know that we have been extremely critical when it comes to um, the um, sequence that has uh, 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 been described by the rulings of the European Court of Justice, Schrems 1, 2015, Schrems 2, 2020. Those are, those are landmark rulings of the European Court of Justice, which make an impact on data protection instruments, including, of course, safe harbor in the first place and privacy shield in the transatlantic dialogue so yes we have also uh, launched a, a number of missions to the united states caring about the impact of the standard of the european standard which i insist is the highest in the world on the transatlantic dialogue and transatlantic cooperation and transatlantic data transfer with the united states and we have of course cared of all the uh, of the of the of the details but having said this i would add that yes we adopted a number of resolutions including that resolution march 2021 in which there was an evaluation report and implementation report followed by a number of hearings including of course european data protection supervisor on the podium and we have then put in practice a thorough examination of these four years of enforcing, of implementing the data protection package. But just, I insist, for the sake of the nature of this discussion, I, I finger pointed the problems aroused by the one-stop shop mechanism and the need to provide legal certainty, reducing administrative burdens and administrative variations between member states for companies and citizens alike so i only intended to highlight that the success of the one-stop mechanism depends heavily on the effort that data protection authorities including irish data protection authorities can dedicate to handling of cooperation on individual cross-border cases and with the European Data Protection Board. And I can only reassure you that the Libre Committee will continue to monitor the situation so that the, 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 the prospects of unfolding in the foreseeable future, the GDPR maybe take years, but it will be a way until it's fully implemented, it's fully deployed in its full potential. Thank you. Would you like to comment also on this question from Ralph? Yeah, of course. Maybe just to say, um, I don't necessarily know that's helpful for an academic lawyer to kind of name DPAs, because I think we, what we need to look at is the system that allows certain DPAs to have this kind of outsized role <laughs> in the overall proceedings. Um, I, I never know whether it's appropriate, but I'm Irish, obviously. Um, and what is interesting is that also the Irish Houses of Parliament, the Oireachtas, um, following submissions by the Irish Council for Civil Liberties and others, have also issued a report indicating that there are um, procedural issues uh, with the administrative proceedings uh, at national level and encouraging the DPC to work with other uh, stakeholders in order to, um, to essentially agree some common procedural standards beyond, you know, before we go to the need for procedural harmonization. So this isn't um, an issue of which there is no knowledge at, at national level either. 
Thank you. Fanny, would you like to add something to that? Um, yes. So um, the reason why, for instance, I didn't call on a specific infringement procedure on Ireland, just mentioned infringe infringement procedures in general, it's not because I disagree with that problem, um, but I think uh, we have to recognize that there are other data protection problems than, than big tech, and, and the reform cannot be tailor-made to that single issue only, as serious as that issue is. And um, I think it is a problem, and that's why I mentioned the study, that we are not really discussing those very basic things on the member states, like, for instance, in France and in other countries, the complete conflation of data processing by the state and by the governing party, which you would think is a, a very obvious uh, data protection um, violation, and we should have protections against them. And I think there's a disproportionate burden, again, on academics, on NGOs to uncover these on-the-ground data protection problems because we are focusing practically almost only on the Ireland and Big Tech thing. Not to say that that's not something to address, but there's much more. Thank you, Fanny. And one more time, thanks for this question, which triggered a, a longer uh, round of answers that initially was uh, scheduled, but we have uh, still a few minutes uh, for more questions. I guess we have five minutes uh, left, right? So uh, if you can have lights again to see who would like to ask a question. Uh, there's a hand here. Uh, is there anybody else maybe so we can take two questions? No. Michael, go. Hi, thanks. Um, uh, <laughs> um, Michael Veal from ah, sorry, UCL. Sorry. Uh, Mike, Michael Veal from UCL. Um, so we're seeing a lot of different digital regulation, and some of it's got centralized, some of it decentralized enforcement. Traditionally, we've seen you know, uh, co uh, companies place themselves in Ireland and Luxembourg, typically, um, and the Netherlands, typically for tax reasons. Perhaps that will change, and the logic will change over time as there becomes a greater regulatory risk. Is there a risk we see even worse arbitrage than we do today, going to really very small member states with very little technical capacity? Um, and is that something that we maybe need to think about rather than focusing on the, the, uh, the current state of play? Um, uh, and in that line, one other thing just on the procedural point, is there scope potentially for a piece of regulation that tries to bring together some of these disparate digital regulators that we're all emerging, we've got lots and lots of boards, lots of different actors, we don't even know who's going to be regulating the AI Act nationally yet. You know, will there have to be a wash-up piece of regulation, maybe a bit like there was for ANISA and, and similar kinds of um, entities? Thanks. Thank you, Michael. And maybe the question from, could you, could you introduce yourself maybe um, first? Max Schrems from <laughs> Panel Before. Um, just super quick, uh, I think we're now again having these like different options and so on. And quick question, how about the end that I asked at the beginning as well? Isn't there like the big tech that we could do like on a European level at some point? Their cross-country case is still that it's just an exit request, which is not going to be dealt with on the European level maybe, where we need some procedural rule across countries. And then there's a national case where it's your problem of your own country, how it, it's dealt with maybe <laughs> from a European perspective. And isn't that an option, the different interventions we now had from the panel to combine them instead of like putting them as alternatives? Could we then answer both questions and use this answer also to uh, say final conclusions because we have three minutes left. So is there anybody who would like to start? Um, Toby, yeah. you first. Happy to try. Um, I think what Michael pointed to was, was the risk of systemic failure. And again, I don't think it's worth you know, singling out DPAs and saying, oh, you're a good one, you're a bad one. Again, pointing fingers at each other. Uh, I think it's more about the system. And to be honest, sometimes Norway is in the minority. We may have a very interesting interpretation that everyone else disagrees with. If we were the LSA, it would be the exact same thing. So it's not about individual countries at all. And it, there is a risk, actually, that as long as you have big EU-wide cases being dealt with by individual authorities, then the, the, there is actually a risk of, of forum shopping. And also picking up on something that Fanny said, and I think it was absolutely brilliant, um, the need for ex officio um, action, because I think well, the procedural harmonization will go a long way in, in 
in aiding is, you know, the complaint handling processes, right? But I think we also need to be mindful of the collective um, consequences when you have data protection violations. Uh, therefore, you do, you do need to be the proactive one. You do need to to, to dig into something that is so obscure that no data subject would ever complain because they don't actually understand or know what is going on. Um, and, and I don't think the procedural law will actually deal with that, maybe. But hey, let's discuss it. Thank you. Arla? Um, yeah, so maybe with the, the, the question about regulatory arbitrage and, and whether things could in fact get worse. I mean, I, I think in an ideal world, um, if applied correctly, there would be no scope for regulatory arbitrage. That is what Article 60 <laughs> is designed to do. And I know it seems like we're, we're a way off that at the moment. Um, but I, I think both looking at this in terms of what the Court of Justice can do to, to facilitate that process, but also what national courts can do if um, national procedures are consistently challenged before the national courts where an argument is made that they are you know, effectively blockading the access of EU rights, then you, you have that kind of effectiveness challenge and national courts can, um, can intervene and, um, and, and consider national procedures to be incompatible with EU law. On the kind of wash up, um, the need for a wash up regulator, I think everyone's watching um, with a bit of trepidation, I suppose, the proliferation of enforcement frameworks that we're seeing through the various um, legislative instruments. And so far, we don't have any uh, good example of effective regulatory cooperation. People speak about the Digital, Digital Regulators Cooperation Forum in the UK. Um, that's very nascent forum. Um, it's still in, in kind of informal <laughs> um, territory, so no kind of formalized uh, enforcement, collective enforcement through those various regulators. But that's probably the type of model that we're looking at. There is something in Article 40 of the DMA um, that, for instance, involves uh, the EDPS and the EDPB with competition regulators. So maybe that's where we'll initially see um, some cooperation between these, uh, these enforcement bodies. Thank you very much. Fanny, last words from you. Um, yes, so I think uh, the um, combined, uh, combined question around uh, the digital, all the digital enforcers, we've, um, we've uh, toyed and experimented with a model that um, is based on definitely a shared resource, shared expertise, shared everything outside the hardcore uh, complaint mechanism and fine. I think that, that that would be an easy bit to set up. Like every national member state has its own, but there's an EU level coordination. And just as the, one, the equality bodies who have to uh, come up with a decision that impacts both technology and discrimination can have access to it, just as data protection, etc. And then we deal with the hardcore enforcement in this more complicated way, I, I can see that work, and that is what we propose for the AI Act actually at some time. And um, I think this whole city, at least the Brussels bubble, is running around asking questions about enforcement. That's been the theme for a couple of months now. And it's not really the expertise of the people in this town. And I think it's great that in this conference we have the regulators, but uh, probably what we will need is just a lot more questions as the, to people on the ground, local NGOs, local enforcers, regulators, because we, we don't necessarily have to know the best answer yet. Thank you very much. And I think this is a very nice conclusion of the, of the discussion and, uh, and the idea behind the conference in general, this is the place to, to give some answers, but also to keep on asking questions that uh, we will try to address in, we'll be all trying to address together in the next days, weeks and months. Thank you very much for this discussion. It was a pleasure and honor to, to moderate it. Um, please thank the, thank the speakers. Who... Thank, you. thank you guys.